The brilliant thing about this Biden administration is that if for a brief moment you forget just how appalling they really are and why, they find a way to remind you. And sure enough, they did it again this week. As we saw the grotesque contrast between the Biden fantasy of blue collar Joe from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and the wretched reality of a weak, cynical machine politician completely controlled by donors and activists, ignoring the horrific poisoning of an entire working class community in East Palestine, Ohio, and instead flying halfway around the world for a photo op designed to steal the valor of brave Ukrainians fighting a war that Biden himself enabled with his weakness and appeasement of Putin. Astonishingly, back home, all we got from Biden on one of the worst toxic chemical spills in America in years was this pathetic tweet thread full of lies and deflections. He claimed the derailment was somehow Trump's fault because his administration deregulated certain brake requirements. But according to Biden's own NTSB, brakes had nothing to do with the derailment and it was most likely caused by an overheated axle. Biden said the EPA ordered Norfolk Southern to pay for the cleanup because it's their mess. Of course, that's true of the derailment, but the much more consequential issue was the decision afterwards to pour toxic chemicals into an open ditch and set them on fire. A move that, according to industry experts, was totally unprecedented and reckless, but approved by the Biden administration. How do we know that? Biden himself told us. You know, we were there two hours after the train went down. Two hours. I've spoken with every single major figure in both, United, in both Pennsylvania and in, 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 in uh, Ohio. Oh, they were there within two hours. By the way, aren't you surprised we didn't have a little moment of demented, angry Biden there. Two hours, not 10, two. According to Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, even Biden's Defense Department was actively involved in the decision to pour and burn the toxic chemicals. As we said last week, DeWine himself must be held accountable. But it's completely outrageous for Biden to try and distance his administration by blaming others, while at the same time bragging about how involved his administration was from the start. As usual, these people who lecture us about ethics and decency are desperate to evade responsibility. Now, it's hard to believe that what you're going to see is real and not a deep fake, but apparently this genuinely was America's transportation secretary this week as the nation reels from devastating train accidents, catastrophic air traffic control meltdowns, and almost daily reports of terrifying aircraft near misses. I'm going to refer you to the comments that I made to the press because uh, right now I'm taking some personal time and I'm walking down the street. Oh, he's taking some personal time. Seems to have become something of a habit in the midst of a crisis that falls within his purview. When McKinsey Pete did finally make it to East Palestine, we instantly knew just how serious he was by the fact that he wore a hard hat and ignored every question reporters asked about his sluggish response. But it's OK, because somebody self-identifying as Pete's press person did have all the answers. Mayor Pete, why did it take you an entire two and a half weeks to actually get here to respond to East Palestine? Will you apologize to the residents of this city for for the, the, the slow response to the government's slow response? Do you have any apology? Press person, I can help you. Sure, 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 sure. So can, can, can we ask? Well, if you are the press secretary of the secretary of the Department of Transportation, don't you think you should be able to ask questions from the American public that Absolutely. you serve? Absolutely, I would like to do it without the camera on. Please. Can I ask why? I think that is a little bit aggressive. That's <laughs> Brilliant. Expecting the federal government that you pay for to answer questions about issues they're responsible for is now aggressive. Of course, the reason they're so discombobulated by all this is that Trump showed up, was welcomed by cheering crowds and demonstrated yet again that he has a natural, authentic connection with working people and blue collar communities like East Palestine. And honestly, you just have to love moments like this. I mean, I do because I love McDonald's, not least because working there was my first job. So I know this menu better than you do, okay? I probably know it better than anybody in here. The serious point is that Biden's response to what happened in East Palestine highlights some of the defining defects of his administration. Creating a problem, denying it exists, finally admitting it exists, but blaming others, and then either doing too little too late to help or more often making the problem even worse. Of course, we saw that in Afghanistan. We see it still every day at the border. And we'll continue to see it with the economy, where they helped create the inflation surge with their reckless spending, claimed it was transitory when it was obvious that it wasn't, blamed Putin 
and then decided to spend even more, making sure that it lasts longer and the high interest rates needed to control it cause even more pain. Honestly, what's gone well? They claim low unemployment, but even there, first it's the inevitable bounce back from the pandemic lockdowns, which they supported, and second, the labor participation rate, the actual proportion of Americans working, as we always remind you, is now the lowest for nearly 50 years. Amazingly, there's no sign of a rethink, even though more than 70% of Americans think we're heading in the wrong direction. Instead, Biden and his crew are heading further and faster in the wrong direction. Look at this extreme and menacing executive order Biden issued last week. They want to embed the woke equity agenda into all aspects of the federal government through artificial intelligence. Doesn't AI already have enough left-wing bias? Chat GPT created by Biden donors, and now the default technology for Microsoft's Bing search engine, refuses to compose an argument in favor of fossil fuels because it goes against Democrat climate zealotry. And while it'll gladly write a story about Trump being corrupt, it refuses to do the same for Biden. Amazingly, they really do seem to be serious about running this senile laughing stock all over again in 2024. As Dr. Jill confirmed on Friday in an announcement that should be treated with the reverence and respect that it deserves. So please put down what you're doing and pay attention as we recite the words of Dr. Jill. And I think, look at all that Joe has done, has accomplished. I mean, he brought us out of the chaos. And he did that. <laughs> people were starving. They didn't have food. And people were afraid. There was so much fear. And so he came up with the American Rescue Plan to help kids get back to school. <laughs> and you know, the things that bringing broadband to all the United States so that all kids have internet. Look at our roads <laughs> and our bridges. Look at healthcare and what we've done. He's done so much. And Darlene, he's just not done. <laughs> well, tell us what you think of all that on the new free Twitter at Next Trev FNC and at Steve Hill to Next. Vivek is back with us. Vivek, um, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Um, what is your critique? Now, thinking of your big announcement this week, your critique of this administration and how an administration that you now hope to lead would be different and better. Well, I think this administration is a symptom of a deeper cancer in America, which is an anti-meritocratic cancer. The people running the show in America today are not the people who meritocratically should be there. Either Joe Biden, but even if you think about, you were talking about Pete Buttigieg. Would he have gotten that job if he were not gay and wear it on his sleeve? Absolutely not. Would Kamala Harris, who was supposed to be responsible for the crisis at the border, gotten her job if it were not for her gender and the color of her skin? Absolutely not. And I think this is just a symptom of a deeper cancer invading every sphere of American life. What we really need to do in our country is restore the idea that you get ahead in America, not on the color of your skin, not on your sexuality, but in the content of your character and your contributions. And while I think a big part of that is in the private sector, it's a big part of why ending affirmative action is a top policy pillar of mine, including in government, it's also restoring merit to government itself. Because as I said before, Steve, it's not the people who we even elect who are actually running the show. As much of a joke as mm -hmm. Joe Biden really is sitting in the Oval Office, the deeper problem is that the people underneath him view him just as a puppet as well. And the administrative yes. state that sits underneath him, they're the ones who actually wield power poorly on his behalf. You, you know what I love about everything you're saying tonight is you really zero in on the crucial problem. In a moment, um, We've got some questions for you from uh, that I asked from our audience on Twitter today, but just one from me, just to follow up on what you said there. Specifically, what would you want to do about the administrative state? I would shut most of it down, Steve. I mean, I've already committed publicly, the first department I'm gonna shut down, I'm gonna do it in week one in office, is the US Department of Education. But that is just the first of many. When these agencies become such a cancerous rot, you can't reform them top down, you have to shut them down. I'm also gonna replace these federal civil service protections. That's anti-meritocratic, saying you can't fire somebody no matter how bad of a job they do. That doesn't work in the private sector. It shouldn't work in government either. To replace that with eight-year term limits for saying that, you know what, if I can't be the next president of the United States for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing, 
I don't think most people working for me in the federal yes. bureaucracy should either. And take a bunch of those administrative agencies in Washington, D.C., and get them out of Washington, D.C., back to the people they're actually supposed to be accountable to. Think about if the Department of Transportation was located in East Palestine, what kind of different reaction we might have had. And so that's just, I'm just beginning to scratch the surface, Steve, but as you can tell, yes. I'm pretty animated about this because it is my top domestic priority to actually decimate the administrative state and restore yes. a three-branch government, not a four- or five-branch government as we have today, between the alphabet yeah. soup of the administrative state and the private sector that they're increasingly deputizing to do their dirty work. That's the real problem. It's really, really, that is a really deep point. That is the structural point that underlies all these other problems. I'm so glad you're focused on it. Now let's move to some of the questions that came in for you today. Um, a couple of them, uh, I'm, I'm just picking them because they, they represented a lot of what our audience had to ask you. This is from Matt Sanchez. Why is he challenging Trump? Why doesn't he support Trump and push for a cabinet or White House job when Trump wins? So it's a great question. First of all, I wanna say President Trump is a friend. I don't even see myself as running against him. I am running for the country. And to be really honest about it, if he hadn't done what he did in 2015 and 2016 as an outsider, then I probably wouldn't have thought about doing what I am today. He sets a high bar, in my opinion. But I am running to exceed that high bar, to take the America First agenda to the next level. Because in order to put America first, Steve, we have to first rediscover what America is. And that is why I'm running, because it's not somebody else's vision. It is my mm -hmm. vision. You and I know this for years discussing on this show, the books I've written over the last couple of years. This is my vision for the country centered on answering the question of what it means to be an American today. I think President Trump's actually misunderstood. I think he actually does care about national unity, but I think national unity is so important that we need to ask ourselves who is actually going to deliver it going forward. And I am running for president to deliver on that mission with a vision of American national identity that runs so deep that it dilutes the woke agenda to irrelevance, not just pounding it into the ground with a hammer. Mm -hmm. Even I've done some of that. But now we need to move forward and actually dilute it with a, with a national identity of American, of a sense of what it means to be American. And I think that's what we're missing. And I believe that's what I can deliver. So there's one more I'd like to put to you. It's from, from a friend of ours, Susan Shelley. Um, it's more of a personal uh, question, but I think these sometimes can illustrate um, a, 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 a deeper point. So I'd like to see your response to this. Um, in your career or in your personal life, have you ever been fooled or misled by experts? And if so, how did that experience affect your thought process and judgment when making decisions today? The answer to that question is yes. I have run multiple companies. And I think that it's opened my eyes to the fact that while you need expert input, there's a difference between a policy decision that's made by a leader and a technocratic mm -hmm. input that's offered by a so-called expert. And I think we live in a moment today in America that mixes up the two. We live in this managerial technocracy, which yes. professes science or whatever other technocratic value is on the table to say that that actually guides a policy decision, whether that's COVIDism, whether that's climatism. I collectively call that scientism rather than science. That is a religion. And we need to unshackle ourselves from this religion that says that the technocrat actually gets to run the show in order to instead have yeah. leaders I was trained as a molecular biologist myself. I've run multi-billion dollar businesses. I've, I'm bluntly financially sophisticated. I understand those expert inputs. You need leaders who can, but you need to be leaders, also have leaders who yes. can separate the actual policy judgment, the moral judgments they're making it's from the technical judgments because they're not one and the same. I'm so grateful for that question because it goes to the heart of an American cancer today that has turned technocracy itself into a yes. religion. And the most dangerous religions are the ones that we fail to recognize are actually religions, Steve. A very, very uh, powerful uh, set of answers to all those questions, Vic. We really appreciate uh, you being with us tonight. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.